Good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, we should get, get started slowly but surely. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you. It's fantastic to see such a large group in the room. I would like to welcome our two vice presidents, Sanjay and Nena, and as well as our, our colleagues. Um, one is Ani, uh, who has just moved, I think, into the group uh, that Sanjay heads, and, um, and Monica from the SDN network, who has been very proactive in engaging with IEG on the learning agenda. Uh, I would like to also welcome our many colleagues from country offices who are following this event because this is being web streamed as we speak. So very welcome to, to you as well. Um, this is a, the launch of an evaluation we completed very recently. And when we conceived this evaluation, it was very much based on uh, wanting to generate a deeper understanding of how the World Bank Group works in different client countries. And we took the approach not just to say like, well, here are the middle income countries, but here is a subset of countries where um, the bank works more through knowledge uh, work rather than lending. These are countries that do not need to borrow, but uh, some cases they do borrow, some of them are big borrowers, but we were more interested in, these are so to say the um, high-end countries where money is not the driver. And if the development trajectory works for all of the World Bank Group's client countries, that is where we're going to go. So we wanted to understand what difference does that mean to the World Bank Group's business model in these countries. Um, it is very fortuitous to have time to closure on the evaluation at this point in time as the bank group is talking about becoming a solutions bank. Uh, the knowledge work is very much around solutions, um, as well as the World Bank Group strategy that apart from the solutions bank, apart from the new global practices, also talks about uh, having a better segmentation of client countries. So not just looking at high, middle, low-income countries and fragile states, but really understanding better the differences between uh, client groups. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to share with you uh, the results of this evaluation, and our panelists will be speaking about how to take these findings forward and what they mean in the context of the World Bank Group reforms and change process. So with that, over to you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. So it's a great pleasure for me to see so many people here and uh, particularly to have a distinguished panel um, of people who are, are sort of leading on these issues across the bank group. I'm very delighted to have Sanjay um, here, both in his capacity um, as um, the, uh, the leader of the World Bank Institute work, but also now on the reform agenda. And there are, as Caroline emphasized, very big linkages from the evaluation to the issues being raised in the reform agenda, fortuitously, I think, but also to some extent through good planning from my predecessors, um, including Ali Kadra, who's now retired. Um, Aristomen Varoudakis, um, just stand up, Aristomen, has led the evaluation um, and then handed it over to Juan Jose Fernandez, who's been finishing it off. So I just want to acknowledge the work that they've done to start with. We have um, Nena Stoilkovic. Um, from uh, IFC's business, business advisory um, services, who again is, is an expert on how knowledge work um, is delivered um, in practice and the linkages between IFC's work and the World Bank's agenda. So it'll be great to hear her experiences in, in very practical terms of these issues. Annie um, das, das Gupta, you, you know very well, has, has been a leader in the bank on knowledge and learning work. Uh, we were speaking to him when I was in DFID, actually. We were exchanging experiences on, on how to promote knowledge and learning from evaluations and from evidence. So he was well known to me even before I came here. And then Monica Weber-Farr um, from the SDN network um, uh, was, was very stimulating in our discussions on the evaluation at the review stage and had plenty of ideas about how this work could be built on. I mean, one of the things that you may know is that IEG is very interested in in um, being strong on accountability and serving Cody and also making sure that our evaluations feed into learning ourselves. So 
learning is impo very important for us. And Monica had ideas on this, and I'm sure she'll comment on some of this in her, in her comments. So we have a very distinguished panel. Um, I hope you've now started to get into your lunch, and we'll now move on to the, the real meat of the uh, um, event. And I'll hand over to Hannah Zay, who's going to give a, um, a 10, 15 minute presentation of the main findings. Um, uh, give the context of uh, to this uh, evaluation. Uh, as, as most of you know, the bank has been uh, rebalancing the way it provides services from lending programs towards uh, more knowledge services. And uh, this has responded to, to an extent to a country's demand that uh, increasingly need less financing, but are still interested in a relationship with the bank that involves technical assistance and economic sector work. Uh, in the chart, uh, you can see, and, and that's the blue line, the one of technical assistance and economic sector work, that uh, this, over the past 10 years, uh, has uh, more than doubled. And then, as a result of that, uh, the Core knowledge services are now about one third of the uh, bank administrative budget uh, compared to about a quarter uh, uh, 10 years ago. And so I think the, the, the time is appropriate to evaluate knowledge services, but in particular, how these knowledge services uh, are delivered in countries whose programs are based basically in those services, uh, as Caroline was saying. So how did we go about uh, doing this evaluation? Basically, the 138 country programs uh, uh, were ranked based on uh, an idea of uh, intensity of knowledge services in these programs based uh, on, on various indicators. And then we focus on the top half uh, of that uh, ranking, and then the uh, final nine countries that were chosen were Bulgaria, Chile, China, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, uh, Russia, South Africa, and, uh, and Thailand. The way uh, the activities in these countries, the knowledge activities were chosen was based uh, on the uh, strategic priorities uh, in the CPS. And that's how uh, we came to have in all of these countries more than 200 knowledge activities. The method that was used was assessing relevance, technical quality, results, and the sustainability of results. And then we did this reviews, uh, looking both at the country partnership strategies and at the activities themselves. And we visited all of these countries, basically to discuss with the authorities and uh, with other stakeholders, and also with uh, bank staff. Now, the nine countries selected are quite representative of the type of countries that Caroline was mentioning. And these are high and high middle income countries. Uh, countries, uh, and in these countries, knowledge services are more than 50% of the uh, country services a, a budget on average. They have a diversified economic structure, no or moderately bank lending, and they are also uh, users of fee-based uh, services. Now, of course, we use this uh, uh, name of knowledge-based country programs as a definition for this evaluation. This doesn't mean that uh, we, we also recognize that in countries that have lending programs, that there is a lot of knowledge embedded in those programs as well. Um, now, in the activities that we uh, looked at and evaluated, uh, a significant, most of the activities were used to raise uh, stakeholder uh, awareness. Um, and uh, then, some of the activities, uh, about half, uh, were for capacity building, design reform, 
and support the dialogue, and about a quarter of the activities were in support uh, of lending or the strategic design of the bank program. Now, the good news is uh, that about 80% of the activities we, re we reviewed uh, either achieved or partly achieved uh, the objectives of the activity. We did not find uh, a difference between uh, technical assistance and economic sector work. And in terms of the sectors, uh, agriculture, education, and financial sector were above average in terms of achieving outcomes, and private sector and economic policy and governance were below average, and we'll come back to that of what may be the reasons. Now, uh, in terms uh, of, of the results, one of the things we found is that when knowledge services were used in support of lending activities, they tended to have better outcomes than the, when these knowledge services were self-standing. There may be a number of reasons uh, uh, why this happened. One uh, is the bank presence in the country. Uh, the other is more established relationships with counterparts in those countries with lending activities. And finally, that these activities may have had better results frameworks compared to the self-standing, and we'll see that that's an issue uh, in, in the activities that we reviewed. Now, what are the, the or what were the ingredients of success uh, in, in, in these activities and in the countries, that, in, in the activities that we looked at? Now, uh, in those activities that were more successful, 90% uh, conveyed international be uh, best practice and relevant examples for the countries. About 55% used local expertise, and 70, uh, more than 70% had actionable recommendations that could be followed up uh, with, with the, the implementation of policies. Now, if we contrast that with what happened with those activities that one, were not very successful, this that did not reach outcomes, only 50% conveyed the international best practice, less than 30% used local expertise, and 50 only 50% had actionable recommendations that uh, could be follow, uh, followed up. The other thing that we found is that those activities that build capacity and built analytical uh, institutional capacity and analytical capacity uh, to, uh, to make policies uh, were uh, more successful than, than, the one that, than the ones that did not uh, uh, provide uh, s uh, such type, type of support. Now, those were mostly then the ingredients of success. And what, what were the areas of weaknesses uh, in, in what the bank did? And the activities uh, showed not so good results when they were unable to, to address some of the issues uh, relevant to the client, uh, when there was no new evidence uh, or data uh, provided for policy making, and when the activity was not delivered uh, on time uh, for, for important uh, decisions of for important uh, policy implementation. In one way or the other, uh, uh, all of these characteristics were present in those activities that were not very successful. Now, when uh, we mention the sectors, uh, the, sec the uh, private uh, sector and economic policy and governance were the ones that uh, had below average results. And in part, I think that what that reflects is that in these cases, there was a need for coordination of reforms uh, across sectors and, in some cases, new legislation. And in both those instances, the results were not as good uh, as in the others. One striking fact in all of these activities um, when we look at the weaknesses uh, and when uh, the results uh, were not so good, was that monitoring and evaluation frameworks were quite weak. In only 17% uh, of, the, of the activities, there was at least 
a, a partial results framework in the country partnership strategy. And in only 23% uh, of the projects themselves, of the knowledge services, there was some results indicators to track the activities, uh, uh, the outcomes, the reaching of outcomes of the activities. And we'll come back to that. Now, as uh, Caroline and Nick were mentioning, uh, the, it's, it's a good opportunity that uh, this evaluation provides a helpful context to uh, the uh, change process taking place at the bank. And I thought that then it would be useful to link the findings that we just discussed with this change process at the bank. And as a general statement, uh, I think that what this evaluation uh, findings reinforce uh, is, is the, the priorities that the change agenda has on knowledge and, and solutions. Uh, one of those priorities is that uh, a client-focused engagement. And it's quite clear from uh, this evaluation that a client-focused engagement is essential, and in particular that responding to client requests and uh, staying engaged in the implementation phases and tapping local expertise were all elements that we found in those activities that were successful and associated with strong results in the activities. Uh, involving the client very early on in the design of activities was also something important. Now, of course, uh, there are challenges for the bank in this area. And what are the challenges based on what we find? One uh, is the need for more client participation in the, the, in the design of the programs. The other one is a better timing uh, of the delivery of the knowledge services for important decisions and uh, more, more use uh, of local expertise. Now, the other part uh, of, of the knowledge agenda is the idea of becoming the best development solutions provider. And from the point of view of this evaluation, maintaining the strategic focus and agile delivery of global expertise uh, is, is probably one of the uh, most important uh, uh, conclusions coming out. And here the bank has some challenges. Uh, one in, in all of this, particularly in the countries that we are talking about, a, a number of, the, of them have reimbursable advisory services. And what we found, although th this was not across the board, but in some cases, was the risk of fragmentation of these programs, with the bank responding very fast on very specific issues, but uh, perhaps in the process uh, losing a bit the big picture. And this would, of course, create problems for the bank being, being effective in the future in the delivery uh, of knowledge services. So here it's very important to maintain this big picture and stay engaged on all those issues that are relevant to the medium-term development agenda uh, of the bank. And the second challenge is uh, deploying a a staff that is very experienced with, with global perspective to formulate decisions to recommendations where the decisions really uh, take into account the, uh, the local uh, situation, but also deliver uh, expertise that, that is the best expertise available. Uh, now, uh, so uh, those are the, uh, are the challenges. And going to the, the issue of monitoring and, and evaluation, one thing that is interesting when, when we look at the science of delivery is that there are three uh, key elements there. One is evidence-based design, the other one agile implementation, and the third structured learning. And all of these elements of the science of delivery require very strong and monitoring and evaluation framework. And this monitoring and evaluation framework appeared quite weak in the uh, activities that we looked at. So if the bank is going to become effective 
uh, in its science of delivery, it, it will need to make a very substantial investment in monitoring and evaluation, and surely this uh, will, will uh, result in very big dividends for what the bank uh, is trying to do. Now, then, uh, to, to sum up uh, what we've been discussing in terms of the findings and the knowledge agenda, uh, country clients acknowledge that the bank is an independent and credible uh, knowledge broker that has the capacity to customize uh, international expertise and also the ability to see the big picture. And uh, in our discussions with them, uh, they see some challenges for the bank, and that is more client participation uh, in the design uh, of the knowledge services, making sure that the timing uh, of the delivery of the services uh, is, is appropriate for the decisions that need to made, uh, be made in the country, uh, making more use of local expertise, which was a weakness in some of the cases we looked at, and then being able to follow up the knowledge services uh, with uh, uh, policy implementation advice. And then here, programmatic type programs uh, may be required. One thing that uh, the clients uh, indicated was that in some cases, bank staff uh, seem to have insufficient experience or global expertise to deal with very difficult uh, uh, policy issues. So this idea of deploying staff with global expertise that is able to adapt that expertise to local conditions remains essential. And as noting, uh, improving the monitoring and evaluation framework of knowledge services uh, is essential uh, given what we saw in the activities we reviewed. And I'll stop there. Okay, thanks very much. So that's just to give you a taste of the, what the evaluation found. Uh, the aim here is, of course, to have a good discussion, and we'll, we'll open up um, after we've invited our panel to speak first and react to, to the uh, issues raised. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn to Sanjay, um, who, who will kick us off on, on my left. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Juan Jose. Um, this is a very well-timed um, Certainly for me, it's very well-timed because I'm very new in my new job, and so this is just extremely well-timed. I uh, So I'm here more to listen than to share any particular <laughs> grains of wisdom, uh, but I think I just found this to be extremely helpful. Now, why is this agenda so important, and how do we situate it within the change process? Um, if you think about the World Bank Group for the future, um, if we have to achieve our, what I call, accelerated goals, if we have to uh, end poverty faster and boost shared prosperity uh, and have a deeper impact. The question is what will be the accelerators which will get us to that goal faster? And we know that we are working on a financial strategy which is looking to expand our financial capacity, which is very important. But in an inevitably financially constrained world, knowledge of what works is going to be one of the accelerators. You know, if you really can expand what is working and scale it up to country clients across countries, this will be one of the accelerators. So knowledge, learning, and innovation can be thought of as one of the big accelerators for the bank going forward. But then what does that mean for how we deliver knowledge services, particularly to country clients who are demanding this? Um, and what this report contributes, therefore, is very important. If we, if we think of knowledge, learning, and innovation as accelerators that can take us there, then how well are we de delivering these services and what are the lessons to be learned ends up being quite a central piece. My own appointment uh, to my position is really the first time the World Bank um, uh, Group has had a vice presidency, certainly on the World Bank side, that's entirely focused on knowledge, learning, and innovation. So this is now my responsibility to <laughs> ensure that we follow through on all these results. So I wanted to quickly share with you just a few points on, as I'm trying to quickly digest the richness of this report and its recommendations, what are some of the elements of the change process going forward where these can be incorporated? And I'd really welcome, Caroline, further work and, and help from, from the group that's done this, because we stand at a particular time when a lot of these recommendations that the change teams made are being implemented or they're being designed for implementation. 
it will be great to incorporate it into the TORs for the global practices, for instance, into how we are doing science of delivery and so on. But in that spirit, let me just share just a few points. The first point is that if you think about the change process and, and really what it's trying to do, it is trying to ensure that um, the first piece of this is on the client engagement side. And the client engagement side, it is trying to introduce a new, more evidence-based client engagement model through the systematic country diagnostics, through the new country partnership framework, so that we focus on those client problems that are the most consequential for poverty eradication and for boosting shared prosperity. So ultimately, that's what it's trying to do, is to create a new client engagement model at the country level so that we focus on those things which are really the most consequential for achieving our goals. And here I immediately see one challenge in terms of what the study comes out and what you will see on the ground. The study points out, if I understood it correctly, that we have been better at specific sector, narrow types of pieces. But if you actually look in country by country, and I bet you as we go through these systematic country diagnostics and as we go through these client engagement uh, the new country partnership framework, and we ask ourselves what can the World Bank group contribute as opposed to what others can contribute. You will find that we are going to be best at helping clients solve major complex development challenges, which are typically going to be multi-sector, multi-stakeholder, so it's climate change, if it's jobs, if it is, you know, whatever these areas are, they are not going to be single sector necessarily. And one of the challenges for us is to come through. So one immediate priority I see is that if we have not been very good at these more complex multi-sector things, that's the reality for us in the future. So how do we do this better? That's one part, critical part of what will emerge. It's not going to be business as usual that we churn out a particular project. Uh, it, we are going to try to help countries solve their biggest development challenges. So how do we do our knowledge work better to address that? The second piece, which is, which is in the change process on the client engagement side, which really resonates and ties in very well with what you have, is to shift from a project approval mechanism to a delivery of results culture, a results delivery culture. You know, right now we, we go to the board, we have a project, and you know, we get approved, we get actually promoted, and then you know, there's not that much focus on results and on implementation. So what it's trying to shift is a focus on solving those big complex client problems. What are the results we are trying to achieve? And then think of a programmatic approach which combines lending, knowledge, and convening services to help the clients achieve that problem. But really focused on are we achieving those results? How do we know that? That's the science of delivery. You know, how do we know that the services are being delivered to the clients? So what does this mean? This 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 thing to shift from a pure project approval to a delivery results culture. One thing it means is that in order to achieve the results, you have to pull together knowledge lending and convening services together as an integrated bundle, depending upon what you need. And within that bundle, I bet you, and that's why it's so important, if you look for the future, the knowledge content of that bundle will increasingly be the distinctive source of value added of the World Bank Group, because others provide finance, others can also do convenience. So this is important. But it will also mean, as you suggest, a shift towards implementation, a greater focus on implementation, not just for knowledge services, for the entire client engagement. And what concretely does that mean? It means that, and this is essential to the science of delivery approach, that you would have greater focus on feedback loops, real-time feedback, given what we were trying to achieve, our citizens, beneficiaries achieving these, mid-course corrections, monitoring and evaluation. So all those recommendations you have are incredibly important in shifting from a project approval to a delivery results culture. It also means sharing tacit knowledge, uh, because a lot of these, these delivery results, you know, how you do it is tacit, and it's either embedded in World Bank group staff who have been involved, or increasingly in practitioners outside. So our ability to capture, codify, and share practitioner knowledge inside the World Bank group, and this is a lot of the work that Monica led for us very ably when we did the knowledge and solutions team, whether we should have knowledge services brokers, services who actually help codify and, and share, download the tacit knowledge from our TTLs and so on so it can be shared because everyone's too busy. That's one of the proposals that Monica put. But that's more internal. Now we need to 
get a lot of tacit knowledge externally, which is how do you mainstream South-South knowledge exchange of practitioners into what we do? So all of these are a shift. These are constituent elements of a shift from a project approval to a delivery results culture. Your recommendations very much bring us in that direction. Uh, and I'm just trying to tie it into the recommendations that are already there, so we need to stitch this. The last point I wanted to make is if the client engagement helps us focus on the most consequential problems, which are typically multi-sector, multi-stakeholder, if our client engagement modality will shift to a delivery results culture, the actual delivery of the solutions is going to be taking place through what we are calling global practices. Now, if we think about, you know, there's a lot of talk about global practices. What are global practices? Global practices, one simple way of looking at it is whatever the challenges are, how do we mobilize the best knowledge, expertise, and resources of the World Bank group to deliver those, which means overcoming our segmentation and fragmentation, which is presently across regions, across sectors, and across entities. Right now, what happens? We, if you're facing a client, you want to deliver the best solutions to the client. That means that solution could be multi-sector. We are organized in sector silos. We are not often able to mobilize that. A big issue is that we are segmented into six regions. And, you know, and the cross support of a flow of staff and knowledge across regions is not taking place. So there's that fragmentation. And there is a third fragmentation, which is across the World Bank group entities. So the global practices are an attempt to combine these institutional assets to overcome these fragmentation and silos so that we can deliver the best solutions to our clients, multi-sector, multi-stakeholder means public, private, civil society, um, and, and so on. So now what this therefore means is that if you just take the overcoming the regional segmentation we have, what our value proposition is, which is very similar to what you have, is that we have a unique ability. We are the only global development bank group. And we have a unique ability to mobilize the best global knowledge customized to local realities. We have a combination of global and local. And so the weaknesses that you point to in our ability to mobilize international knowledge is what I hope we will overcome when we have global practices. Because in global practices, you'll have a clear, unified, locus of responsibility and accountability for the global practice director to mobilize the best experience in service of the client. So that is a accountability metric that with your help we should be actually be designing. How do we ensure that we don't have a repeat of that problem? But what I found fascinating in your conclusions also, in your findings, is that you mention that there were very interesting uses of local partners and local institutions, you know, in the successful, you know, so the China example was mentioned and so on. Now, you know, we have been so egocentric in how we do deliver our work. We try to incorporate all these expertise internally. But if we can leverage a lot of local institutions who understand that local context. So in the design of global practices, it is not just what we have internally but what we can leverage externally, both locally and globally, that is going to be a very useful thing. So I just wanted to, I guess, um, close by saying that we, as we are developing these, the design of global practices, it will be crucial to build into the accountability metrics of the global practices that there is someone accountable for the results that you see. And and how do we measure that? And how do we ensure that there's someone accountable? Because they'll have more response, they'll have more flexibility. But how do they ensure? So you know, uh, some of these things didn't work. But did someone care that it didn't work? Did someone care that international knowledge was not being mobilized? Did someone care that we, we were codifying or not codifying? Now, these are opportunities as we go forward to institutionalize and incorporate it into the incentive structure of global practice. So I want to end by putting an offer on the table to our IEG colleagues to work with us in structuring these incentives going forward so that we don't have a repeat of the problems that you see, but more positively, so we can maximize some of the good practices that you see. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. That was very interesting. I know there were certainly people in, in our discussions with the board members in the run-up to the Cody discussion on the evaluation. There were certainly people there who cared 
about whether the bank was mobilizing global expertise and local expertise particularly came up several times in the discussions. I'm now going to hand over st straight away to Nena from IFC. Uh, thank you, Nick, and, and thanks a lot for, for inviting me to, to attend this panel where I'm surrounded by my colleagues from the Knowledge and Solutions <laughs> Working Group. We worked about six months together on something that we are now continuing to do some work uh, work on. I think all four of us um, worked on, on that together. I mean, my as you were presenting, uh, I was just thinking of um, uh, relating your conclusions uh, with the road that we have taken on the advisory services si side in IFC and how we kept learning by doing and reshaping what we are doing there, but also in relation to what Sanjay talked about, where is the World Bank Group now going in partic particular in relationship uh, in relation to the global technical practices. As you all know, I'm, I'm in charge of the part of, of IFC uh, called advisory services, which is what I like to believe that value added part when we work with private sector clients and in some cases governments, um, th that, that part that our clients through all the client surveys value the most. I mean, and I think that comes very clearly from, from your evaluations. And um, I've seen it actually in the region. I've seen some of the great examples where, um, where that value add helps us learn in one country and then replicate in another. And I wanted to mention the energy efficiency work that we, we have done in Russia, where we worked with the World Bank Group to help the government set up energy efficiency law and regulatory framework to stimulate energy efficient inv um, investments and, and practices. But then we also invested with a number of banks and clients to spread that, that out and learned along the way so that we could replicate it in China and many, many other countries. Countries. So we know actually how to do it, and there are places where it has worked, but I think the challenge for all of us is to do it in a more systematic way. Another challenge that we, we have in IFC as advisory services went through its evolution. You may remember that it was almost 100% decentralized, that people were sitting in different pockets in different regions and doing whatever the client or whoever approached them wanted them to do. So we moved from that world of about maybe 10, 15 years ago to something that became a little bit more structured. Um, so all of the advisory work we now provide through four advisory business lines. Um, that are, I think, uh, somewhat similar to what we have in mind when we talk about global uh, technical practices. But I mean, that that is just the beginning to me of the evolution that we still have to take because advisory services in IFC are more linked now to our investment services business, but I don't think that they are fully linked yet. So the challenge and something that we are working on is um, how to leverage all the tools that we have and products on the investment side and, and the specialized advisory services that we provide through four business lines to deliver the best global uh, product or, or knowledge to our client, wherever that client is. But I'm more and more thinking how that space uh, that we are covering in the private sector will link to what we are trying to do at the World Bank Group level through the global technical practices. And and, and I think we are now looking into what it means for IFC and how we will link again to the World Bank Group because I agree with Sanjay, I think we can do a lot better if we have a better, more coordinated approach across the organization so that we at the public, private, learn from each other. So a lot of work on our side as well to align ourselves with the global technical practices. Um, I also wanted to mention the results um, measurement framework. I mean. Uh, Obviously, there are three ways how uh, we assess our projects, both on the investment and advisory side. Um, one is ex post, so when we invest or we advise, we look back and, 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 and say how it has worked. We have uh, dots that some of you are m familiar with on the investment side, development outcome. We have development effectiveness on the advisory side. So it's really looking back. And then um, we also have a, a something that we introduced going ex ante as we design our programs or projects. And it helps us also nicely align investment and advisory and maybe relevant to what we're trying to do through the World Bank Group uh, technical practices. We have um, IFC development goals, which are basically telling us what we would like to achieve through that particular project. Project, how many people will have access to power, how many people will have um, access to, to health services, etc. So uh, we, we keep learning through that, but I also want to add the work that IEG is doing because I think um, uh, there has to be, the, 
the work of IFG, IG has to be embedded in our project structuring, exactly what Sanjay said, so that we learn from uh, what we've done in other places and we can provide that best global knowledge customized to particular circumstances wherever the client um, is. Um, our challenge, as I mentioned, has been to align investment and advisory services around the same strategy um, and then obviously incentivized by the same goals and objectives and incentives, uh, but we realized that the way to do it is really to stimulate the knowledge um, culture in IFC. Uh, I talked about it in the same room, I think, maybe a year ago, that we hired uh, someone who is an expert in, in knowledge uh, management from the outside, uh, who actually has been able to structure this whole space for us and has worked very closely with Ani and his colleagues in terms of how we link it through the World Bank Group. So dedicated people, dedicated team helped us uh, <laughs> spread this out, uh, establish champions in the region so that we de-silo the whole <laughs> space. Uh, so there is what we call community of practice of knowledge uh, that we currently have through which we share uh, what we learn on investment advisory side and also with the, with the bank. I think it's very important. And we also have a governing body called the um, Knowledge uh, Committee um, which, which governs that all of that space. Again, uh, how do we link among ourselves? Uh, what is the next step for us? How to, to kind of widespread this? And so far, all these efforts, most of these efforts has, have been focused mostly internally on IFC staff, how to learn from each other, how to know what is this combination of tools and products that we are going to provide to the client. But I think there are some recent events that were client-focused, like FinNet on the financial inclusion side, mm -hmm. where you have governments, clients, IFC staff, World Bank staff, sharing knowledge on, on on financial inclusion. So the more we can go towards the client um, in terms of organizing some of these knowledge events, the, the better. And then Sanjay already referred to a few things that we have done together uh, with, with the colleagues from the World Bank Group, which I think are a beginning of what we need to continue to do. Um, uh, we had a number of events that we called <laughs> smashing silos where we really want to demonstrate that we have to work more horizontally rather than within our respective units wherever we sit and I think that has been very successful and we should continue with that. Uh, we have just um, combined the two knowledge platforms into one called Spark which will allow us to collaborate across the World Bank Group uh, and to include colleagues from different organizations as we, as we discuss issues and structure our projects. We will also include their community finder uh, and skills finder and talent marketplace, if I'm not mistaken, again, to know where are the people who can provide uh, some of the services and, and, and uh, what we need to, to service the client. And last but not least, uh, I, I deeply believe that through the structure of global technical practices, we will be able to move this whole space uh, to completely different level, again, having learned um, on what it did for IFC when we went from decentralized to more kind of global business line model. I think uh, it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for all of us to provide the best that the World Bank Group has to offer to our clients and actually to increase our competitiveness uh, because of our footprint. We are in so many places. We can combine private and public solutions. We have a range of products on the financing, investment side, and the range of services on the advisory and knowledge side. I could not think of a stronger uh, institution in the world to offer that um, to service the development in our client countries only if we can get it right. And I think uh, a lot uh, more on that to come uh, very soon. I'm extremely optimistic uh, about the work that's currently taking place. Thank you. Okay, well, that's the IFC picture. And uh, let's hear a bit more about the bank side from uh, Annie and then Monica. Thanks a lot, and thank you very much for including me in this. I must say that um, you, I can't tell you how much it warms my heart to see so many people in this room uh, worrying and thinking about how to do the knowledge work. This is critical for the bank, and it's so good to see so many people here. So um, I'm sure the free lunch helped, but I'll ignore <laughs> that. I think this is, this is a very important report uh, and a very timely report, and uh, we have been um, working, not working, I just independent. We've been supporting this uh, development from the beginning and we very much welcome this report. 
And, and this discussion, this shift in our program is taking place. Every one of us know the knowledge part of our work is increasing, and we as a bank um, has been trying to figure out how to deal with it. I mean, we started in 2010 with a knowledge report, trying to say, okay, what strategy shall we have for the bank? If you look at the strategy that just went to the board, knowledge is central to the first time <coughs> proposition, the whole change process, how we do knowledge better. So I think the way this study was put together to look at knowledge-centric um, country program was very timely to see in nitty gritty, what, how does it impact us uh, on the ground? How can we do this better? I just want to say though from the bank, we all believe all our country programs are knowledge-based. Uh, so I just want to clarify that this year, the study is specifically looking at the advisory services and uh, non-lending and technical assistance part of the work. So it's when we say a knowledge-based country program, I hope we are all our country program knowledge-based. But these shift of doing more of knowledge-based uh, advisory work and less of lending work is happening across our portfolio. And it, that has fundamental shifts of how we design our country engagement. So if you look at Malaysia, for example, who hasn't borrowed from us for a long time, but consistently we do knowledge work there. The question is, how, we, how, how well are we doing it? Are we very well placed to do it? So I, as you read this report, I hope all of you, if you haven't yet, look at it. There are some three or four very big questions the report actually asks that we need to think about and follow up on. Um, our ba basic belief when we started doing uh, advisory work early <coughs> was we want, need to do the knowledge work to make sure our lending programs are solid and grounded. That's how advisory work got started. And if you see, uh, even in these very knowledge-centric countries, 25% of the work was designed towards them, and we do pretty well in that. That's the finding. So the question is, you know, if, we, if our lending program in a particular country is going down, what happens to that piece of work? What do we do? The second assumption we had is that a lot of our knowledge, and Sanjay talked about that, is about knowledge about doing. Our, 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 our uh, comparative advantage is about things that we learn from doing in a particular country. Um, so if we stop doing a lot, meaning not be engaged in uh, lending activities, what happens to that kind of knowledge? How do we remain on top of that knowledge, which I think a lot of client values, and you saw in the report. So there is a, in these countries where the shift is taking place, we have to see very carefully what. The third shift that's taking place, which we have raised before in our work, is that we actually are doing less and look basic uh, diagnostic econometric work that we used to do. Even in these countries, if you see, a lot of the work we are doing are very specific problem-centric um, work in a very sectoral work, which is actually in some ways very good. Our clients really appreciate it. But we are not doing basic econometric work. We have raised this question, what does it mean for us for in the future to be able to do advisory work? Because a lot of our advisory work, if you look at, is based on this basic econometric work. PERs of the world, poverty analysis, you know, things we used to do regularly, which we don't. So these, these are really fundamental questions that's been asked very correctly, I think, that help us think about what will the future country program look like? What will this uh, diagnostic work we need to do will look like? So I really want to congratulate Nick for your team. It's very timely because there's an inflection point that's taking place of the programs and our relationships in these countries. And it'll happen if you look at the data that they, DEC uh, put together. Uh, this, there'll be many more countries where we'll be doing knowledge-based <laughs> work and much less lending work. The second one I want to make is the importance of measurement that uh, the presentation pointed out. Um, as you do more of this work, it's very important to be able to know what is, where you're making an impact and where you're not. Uh, because even if that diagram that you just saw, the first slide that was, which says we do $600 million of knowledge work, that was last year. This year we looked at it's actually more than 700. This will increase. The amount of work that we dedicate to knowledge will increase steadily. Um, the question is we have to know that this money is being spent properly. Our view is a lot of, we have put a lot of management attention to actually build the kind of results framework that uh, uh, the presentation talked about. We need to do much better. But I also want to make a plug here that IG also needs to do much more of surveillance of knowledge work than it does today. Uh, and this is something, that, so this is a very welcome work. Because no matter management work or looking at knowledge, 
can never really look at impact like the, this particular work look at. You have to get an independent view of whether it's having impact. So we would very much welcome IG's um, involvement actually going forward. Um, the last point I want to make is, you know, uh, we actually, what is very welcome from us, a lot of the recommendation here about doing grounded work, having uh, ongoing engagement, having programmatic work, is all we have very much accepted and actually trying to work on. So we very much welcome the recommendation. It really supports a lot of the work we're trying to do. One thing I hope, um, Nick, and uh, you would agree, we need to do much better in disseminating date lessons that come out from IG work to our daily work. And with Monica's team, we're trying to do something very simple, and I, this is not yet done, is to take the lessons and make it accessible to um, to task teams, because I think there are a lot of gems here that needs to be translated and used every day, and I we would very much welcome, as Sanjay already extended, to work with you to see how this dissemination can be done. And the last point I want to make is that I also would like to hear from, if we have a chance to any discussion, about the kind of things we need to do better so that teams can deliver better knowledge and advisory services on the ground. A lot of change is taking place, but this shows us some lessons I would very much welcome to hear from you things we could do better to make our advice service more effective. Thank you. It's always great when our evaluations lead to uh, lessons for IEG as well. Um, Monica, over to you, please. Thank you. And uh, I think I'm uh, the last person here, so I'll be trying to be quick. Um, uh, ten quick points, uh, each point in 30 seconds or so. Um, first of all, uh, this is a really fantastic report, and my team already thinks I'm nerdy, but um, this is something I read over the weekend, or I really enjoy reading. Uh, it's not only interesting, it's also quite fun when you look at it for your own uh, work. Very, very pragmatic, comes at the right time. Uh, the recommendations are complementary to what we all do. And as a knowledge management person, it uses the concepts that you find in knowledge management theory around the bank's role or the bank's staff's role as knowledge producer, customizer, connector. In knowledge management, we're talking about growing, flowing, and turning into value. Uh, the terminology is all right. I mean, really uh, beautiful. Um, uh, the other thing I really liked about this was that um, is the design, and that's something to be debated, because um, we talked about knowledge intensity, right? And that in many ways it's actually a misleading concept, because uh, not only because we do more investment somewhere doesn't mean we do less knowledge. In fact, the uh, in SDN, 90% of the knowledge we transfer to our clients comes through our investment work when we're calculated. So in fact, what this report looks at from an SDN perspective is really only one small sliver than 10% of our knowledge work. But uh, what is nice about the design, it's been done, if you will, in the toughest countries. It's been done in places where we don't have a lot of leverage, in places where we are maybe number 25 on the list of people that get invited to the uh, New Year's reception at the Prime Minister's house. Um, so uh, actually making yourself heard, being present, etc., etc., is much, much more complex and, uh, and tough there. So from that perspective, looking at the design um, of the report, when you say, okay, we've looked at knowledge, products uh, done in a really complicated setting makes total sense, a lot of really good learning. You wouldn't want to do it where it's super easy. Um, there's a couple of concerns, and that's the second point that I wanted to make that we really share. Uh, one of the biggest ones uh, uh, that come out in the report is that less than a quarter of all the um, products that you have examined have uh, look at results on an outcome level. Now, what this means is that people do events that say the objective of this activity report, whatever, is to I don't know, share knowledge, right? And that's where the buck stops. Okay, so I've shared knowledge. If you are selling toothpaste, you cannot say the intent of selling this, of producing this toothpaste is to have it in the shelves. The intent is from it to go from the shelves into the bags of someone to return some money to make sure that they come back next time, ideally in the process of cleaning their teeth, 
or making them think they cleaned their teeth. But um, uh, that is a really, really concerning thing. We've looked at this uh, with our SDN um, projects. We have the same concern there, and I'll talk a little bit later about why we think this is the case. Um, other things that we really share in terms of concerns are the staffing limitations, um, that we have around half or so of the um, cost of uh, AAA, uh, and that was also noted in the report, spent on consultants. Now, this may not be as bad as it looks like, and I would welcome more insights, because at the same time we're saying we have to involve more local counterparts. Oftentimes that goes through consultant contracts, and it would be very useful to take another look there, uh, particularly in the context of building knowledge hubs and that kind of thing. Uh, the third thing um, uh, that we share concern with is how much of our own staff, particularly uh, the younger, but across all levels, get to do AAA. Do we put our best staff? There is nothing better than a knowledge service than to rejuvenate your knowledge. And everybody here in the room, if I would ask around, my bet is if I ask you where have you yourself learned most in the last 10 years, it would probably be when you TTL'd or contributed to a knowledge product. So this is an absolutely important instrument for our own learning, and that is something you know, that I don't think we do, do enough of. So we share a lot of the concerns. The third thing is there are a number of suggestions that we really like from the SDN perspective and that will help us going forward. Uh, specifically, the recommendation to move more towards the RAS work. That's very important uh, for us in many of our countries, but also where we are often at the interface with clients who really can pay and need to pay. Um, the uh, questions around long-term presence in country, um, giving our uh, counterparts respectable staffing levels to deal with. That's very important also on the SDN side. We've done quite uh, some moves on moving some of our folks out there. But very importantly, and I think a number of us have commented on this, this question of creating a circle of continuous quality improvements. Um, I'll come to that at the end with a question to IEG. And yes, Nick, this is the moment to ask you guys things too. Um, so there's a lot of things that uh, we really like uh, on our end. But there's also a few, and I wanted to mention that as a fourth, that are good for further investigation. So the report says, for example, self-standing AAA is less effective than when with investment. Now, one thing we know, we've done this research in SDN, it actually works the other way around too. So self-standing lending without a lot of knowledge before and after is also not as good. We've done, our colleagues in the agri-sector have run these numbers for years, and it always comes out the same thing. What we actually don't know is why. So we don't know, is it because only when you put, have enough skin in the game will you actually put the attention, right? Only when you're there with all your uh, people, with the country director knowing about it. Uh, is it client attention? Is it size? Is it that sometimes these things are too small? Um, is it a time frame that they're too short? Or is it simply that you end up with a better results framework when you combine the two? What, I mean, that, that would be really the next step to figure out why is this. Um, uh, the other thing that would be really interesting for further investigation is the report says, the less complex, the better. When we look at the analysis of investment projects that has been done a year ago by DEC, it's actually the other way around. Um, there, the projects that are more complex, that are multi-sectoral, they come out significantly better. Interesting question to check out why, what's the reason? Do we, is it really a question of under-resourcing? Is it a question of what kind of knowledge you need to leverage? That's the kind of insight that's difficult to operationalize, but that would be very useful to take a deeper look at. Um, uh, last point for further investigation that I would find very interesting to take a look at is, why do so few people invest in dissemination? Is there any logic to that? Or are we just dumb? I mean, what is it? What makes us produce things and then not take them out? Uh, it's, uh, I mean, to me, it's a total mystery. Do we need a guidance? Is there pressure on, you know, what, what is it that makes us do this really very uh, weird thing? Now, um, a couple of caveats um, uh, that uh, um, I also wanted to mention is, and that goes in that same direction. I don't know any TTL that intentionally does do 
poor work, right? Nobody, uh, or I haven't met them, um, uh, would say, you know, I go out with my project and I don't want to have impact. Um, I don't want to involve local consultants. I don't want to reach out. I don't want to make sure my minister has actually read it. So um, when we think about this, um, we, we really need to understand what makes people make these poor choices. What are the tough choices that sometimes you have to make? Why are we under-resourcing these things? Sort of to look a little bit more at perhaps the institutional dynamics, and that's really where it's so useful for the report coming at the time when we're changing a little bit the screws uh, at the um, sort of skeleton that keeps the organization together so that we can get a bit smoother in um, going forward. Um, that was number five. Number six, what will we actually do in SDN? Primarily, uh, we will in the next year actually invest in some of the how-to. Um, we've done, we've started that last year with uh, the No Olympics. We will do more at our SDN forum uh, in the next uh, uh, calendar year. But the general notion for people to learn a little bit more about the how-to of good knowledge products um, seems to me to be um, something worthwhile taking a look at. Uh, we rarely um, hire knowledge specialized people. We hire excellent agronomists. We hire excellent water engineers. We hire excellent port specialists. But um, do we actually, when do we tell them how to do this kind of thing, right? Um, and uh, incidentally, um, but that gets me to my last point, my questions on Sunday. I had a question on you on this one. But number seven, what does it all boil down to? In my eyes, yes, there are 10 points, I think, that one can boil it down to, but maybe even three. So what is the secret of getting your knowledge product right? It seems to me when you read the entire report, there's three things left. One is you need a good objective, and that has to be one that's behavioral. It has to be one that's about change. It has to be one that's worthwhile for the person that's receiving the knowledge to be actionable for them. Number two is we need to resource it right in terms of people and in terms of dollars. And that seems to me where most of the limitations were. People, not just in the number, but also sort of the combination of local and uh, sort of global. And thirdly, it seems we need to have skin in the game. This cannot be uh, things that aren't mentioned in the country um, strategies. It cannot be things that uh, the country manager or director doesn't know about. It cannot be things that don't come to the attention of the counterparts. So if you take these three things, all the other recommendations can flow from them. Because if you set the right objectives, you wouldn't end up not disseminating. If you set a, if you resource it right, you wouldn't end up with a poor client engagement, et cetera. So maybe if we work around these three, we can actually collectively share uh, a little bit more on this. Going forward, and that's number eight, what we would like to suggest is we extend this uh, work to the regional and global work. Uh, on the knowledge side. So this was a very welcome analysis of the country-based programs. Um, we spend about 45% uh, um, per, um, per product more on regional or global work. So it would be a very worthwhile exercise. But also because, uh, and that was noted, the bank's role in being an independent um, or considered to be an independent broker, a credible broker of knowledge, is extraordinarily important for us as an asset in SDN in all our work around climate change, around infrastructure finance, etc. If we are at risk of losing that reputation, um, then we've lost the game. And this kind of work uh, is going to be essential in us being able to, to maintain that. So I would welcome a collaboration on this going forward. So that gets me to my two questions, since I have the illustrious podium here with me. Um, uh, Sanjay, um, what about we think uh, introducing some of this into the OCC for TTLs, um, so that uh, we can um, have more than the current 45 minutes on knowledge products in there, but actually really train folks. <coughs> We've started talking with the team, and they're very open about it. But I think uh, collectively, we can really try to say, if this is so important for us, how much are we actually going to give our staff the opportunity to learn about it? Um, another question we should think about in the change process, Sanjay, is um, do we need a separate results group that looks at uh, um, performance? Uh, IFC has that. 
And in IFC, you can have a conversation around results with that group that doesn't have to maintain its independence as important this would be for IEG. So that may be something for us to, to think about uh, going forward. And finally, uh, my two questions to IEG. Um, one would be, can we learn a little bit more from the insights that are behind your analysis? So for example, I would really like to know what are the um, 24%, what are the actual well-formulated objectives when you're saying 24% of them do them? Can we not put them out, the fantastic ones, right, the really good ones, um, so that the rest of us can learn from them? So where you go and isolate good examples, can we go to learning from excellence? And the final, and that's a biggie, um, uh, and that is uh, we've talked a lot about learning throughout project implementation and then needing to shift. If I look at IEG evaluations, if you change your design halfway through your project, that's a guaranteed ticket to an unsuccessful or partial successful. So um, can you guys maybe get a little bit more helpful for <laughs> or encouraging or challenging for us? Challenge us to change our minds uh, rather than make us stay with the opinion we had three years ago when we designed it. Uh, I think that would help not just the knowledge products. Thank you very much. I knew you should be good value. All right. Um, so thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, that's a really excellent combination of um, comments and experiences and uh, relating it to the practical issues that people are working on, including, of course, global practices. Um, I'm now going to open it up to the floor, and I'll come back to the panelists at the end, of course, and give you a chance to sum up and, and answer some of those big questions. Um, if you'd like to queue up at the microphones uh, on either side of the room, um, there are IEG colleagues here, so I'd encourage them to um, respond to a couple of the points if, you, uh, if you'd like to do that. Um, in fact, I can see uh, John is heading to the mic already. So perhaps, John, you can tell us a little bit about the uh, learning evaluation. Well, thanks very much. Uh, great opportunity to promote the next upcoming IEG evaluation. Uh, IEG's job is to anticipate where the bank is going next. And around the late 1990s, the unit of account, as Sanjay reminded us, was clearly the country. That is now changing. It's not the country, it's not the region, it is the global practice. We've just had an evaluation which has looked at knowledge in a country context. The next evaluation, which is about learning in lending, takes a global focus and looks at the transmission of lessons in the lending cycle, not just within a country, but across countries, to see to what extent to um, refer to the new verb that uh, Nena created today, which is de silo -ize. Are we capable of de silo uh, Because the matrix evaluation a few years back showed us that uh, cross-support between regions is not working. And so we really do need to move to this new world of uh, global practices. And in this next evaluation, we will do our best to see uh, where we're going. Thank you. Sorry, can you introduce yourself, please? Myself? Mike Diamin. I work for IFC in investment climate. And I was also in Thailand uh, during the time when we were phasing out of our lending program uh, in the East Asian financial crisis and moving into country development partnerships. And we tried to pro program uh, sort of programmatic themes around knowledge and uh, an accountability framework. So I'm, I'm sure some of those are on all sides of uh, the success line here. Um, I, I, I really like the report, I like the study, and I'd like to make sure we also embed it in what we do going forward and double down on some of the ideas. Um, I think on our investment side, investment lending side, and, and including IFC as an investor, we've gone to the point of understanding that the first iteration isn't always the last, and that some of the development questions don't emerge until after you start the work, and that it's necessary to have an ongoing sort of continuous process. We have adaptable program loans, et cetera. Um, and IFC as an investor always has to go back and monitor its investments. But on a 
ESW, traditional ESW, as well as traditional investment lending, it is pretty much of an upfront investment that then becomes somewhat static as the product is handed over. Um, I think knowledge also needs to go through that shift to something that's an ongoing process, and we need to think about how that, how that would work. Um, I'd also like to double down on the client engagement piece. I think we, you're absolutely right that local, local uh, knowledge providers might be helpful, local consultants, but I actually think it's the client. We really need to have the client much more deeply embedded in knowledge work, and so that this is a joint learning process, a journey, and that they themselves eventually get into the position of setting those objectives and the M&E framework which we would be accountable to with them. Uh, only if they really are in a position to understand, understand global practice, understand what's possible and not possible, can we really be held accountable and they themselves be accountable to those, to those uh, ideas. Um, f so, uh, you know, uh, let them establish the outcome targeting. Finally, um, the idea of peer review in South-South, which I think Sanjay had mentioned, I actually think it's important not only to have South-South and peer review as part of ESW or learning uh, work, but also part of the ongoing process of discovering what is and what isn't working. So an ongoing peer review, because only if you have some mechanism, the, the TTL is embedded. The TTL is not going to fully understand or be, will be, will have sort of bought into why isn't working. But having a, a group of peers, and sometimes accountability to peers is stronger than accountability to us, um, on, go, on an ongoing, regular, six-month, annual basis, show up and say, where are you against where you want it to be? And let's think about mid-course corrections. I think that would energize this sort of continuous improvement process. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Bahar, if you could um, just let us know if there are any questions coming from countries and regions, please. Yes, there are. Um, thank you. Our first question is from Latin America and Caribbean region, from LAC. Um, it is the question for Monica, um, and the person, our staff member wants to know, can you please elaborate on the right uh, combination between local and global knowledge, and do you have any specific recommendations or examples? Thank you. Um, we'll just take a couple of questions from this end of the room, and then I'll come back to the panelists for the first round. Hello, thanks. Um, so my, na my name is Austin Kiro. I'm a TTL in, in the um, Africa region. I just wanted to pick up on what I thought was a wonderful suggestion to actually train people in the production of knowledge. Um, that's definitely something that I noticed when I took the OCC. I think that the, the interesting thing for me is that this is something which could not only benefit knowledge creation, it can also benefit investment operations. Um, I've been quite surprised uh, when I've been part of a Lenny operation and uh, whoever is leading it has a fixed idea in their mind about, you know, this is going to be an operation that does A, B, and C, you know, different types of components in the in the lending project, without starting from the from the from the problem. So, uh, you know, if if OCC included, you know, we could, we, we, it, it's, it has to be a lot longer than 45 minutes, but basically t training on team problem solving, which I think is, for me, one of the key things that the World Bank lacks. And I've been very interested at the reactions of uh, personnel who've come in from consultancy firms from outside the World Bank and they almost can't believe that we're not trained in, in problem solving, not only from an individual perspective about starting with a problem and working backwards to what needs to be done, but also how really to work with a team to do that. I mean, um, personally, I found that one of the, the best experiences that I've had in the World Bank is seeing how, where teams can be greater than the sum of their parts. And that doesn't always happen, but it's something that we need to be trained in both for knowledge and operations. Thank you. We'll just take one more then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Samia Malham. I'm in the SDN network. I, I lead the practice we have on technology for transformation. Thank you very much. This is so timely. I have two very short questions. The first one is about accountability. The, the great picture, I mean, the picture is great, and um, we know where the problems are. But at the end of the day, it's all about behavior. You have hundreds or thousands of TTLs trying to do exactly the same thing in different countries, sometimes in different um, cities of the same country, and somehow always, or more often than we would like, reinventing the same solution. 
and we have vendors at our doors, and we don't have any systematic way to evaluate what it takes to do exactly the same thing as everywhere. We all get that, and we're working on becoming a solution bank. But at the end of the day, it's going to be about behavior. At the end of the day, it's when we have this PCN or this PAD or decision meeting, who are the peer reviewer? Have you actually looked at this wealth of knowledge and content that we've been building for years? And who's going to monitor that? So that's one question that I have. How will we do all this? Nina mentioned the, the changes in HR and IFC, and I'd like to see us changing the same thing um, the way we do that at the bank. And the second shorter question is, oftentimes we um, tag failure something that just didn't live long enough. So we have that AAA or that ESW, and it's maybe part of the 24%. However, if we spend more time on dissemination, and not any dissemination, very strategic dissemination to the right stakeholders, and if we give it one more year or two more years, we might be surprised with the success. So what are we doing with that multi-year, longer um, time span that we have, and how will we invest a little bit in that so that we can see better results? Thank you. Many thanks. Um, yeah, let's um, go back to the panel now. Um, I think I'll start at the far end with Monica. There was a question specifically for you, and feel free to pick up on the other ones if you if you wish to. Thank you. So the question was, what's the optimal um, sort of split up or combination between local and global knowledge? And uh, um, while I do not want to go into where the best split up for that is, say, in irrigation or in um, social development or so, uh, I just wanted to mention um, uh, two useful, perhaps, concepts there. Um, um, and one is to think about this by way of technical versus personal. And on the technical versus personal, technical, I think we, we often find reasonably easy, right? finding a good technical specialist who can understand the technical concepts that are involved in a particular project um, is needed locally so that you can explain this, translate it into local terms, so that you know somebody needs to understand how the bridges are built in the country before you actually start adopting the bridge building concepts from other countries. Um, similarly, you do need to understand the global ones. Um, but where the concept, the, the difference to personal is involved is we too often forget that on the local end, there are elements such as building trust, knowing people for a long time so that you actually know how to interpret the politics of the day, uh, being able to find resources and build support, uh, being able to create the um, political environment, to create the authorizing environment so that the work that you do can be successful. These things are hard if not impossible to be done by an international either staff or consultant um, and uh, it was very interesting when I was looking the other day at uh, the science of delivery work right and the point is when you think about the factors of success trust for somehow I think we need to sort of verbalize this a little bit better these are really critical elements of change process that we understand what role they play uh, on the global end uh, what is an absolutely critical element there is precisely the fact that you come from the outside, precisely the fact that people have international networks that nobody locally has, precisely the fact that one can bring the positive encouragement, the see it worked there. I mean, it goes sometimes so basic that you can say to a mayor in a country, the mayor in that other country, they succeeded. That gives people the hope, the simple hope that you can succeed, and sometimes it is that on a very personal level that is needed, what you can't do as a local specialist. So that concept between technical and uh, personal, I think, can really help address how one wants to build the best mix between local and global. Thank you. Um, I think I'll turn to Sanjay next, because I think the question about um, sort of behavioral issues uh, might be, uh, or any of the other questions, whichever you um, there were several points. Uh, I, I just wanted to say one thing first on global local, uh, building on what Monica was saying. So if your ultimate objective is to achieve results, if you want to help, uh, help clients achieve results, uh, bringing international knowledge can inspire, it can give you, you know, good examples of how things have worked. Um, and bringing deep tacit knowledge of how implementation was done can help. I think what we fail to think about 
is that if you're ultimately trying to get better results, that is a political economy process on the ground. It is not a simple technical issue. And therefore, if you're not thinking just of de delivering a product or as you know, you did it and you went away, if you really are forced to think in this delivery cycle terms that you're trying to achieve a result, then you have to think about how do I get the stakeholders on the ground to get inspired, empowered, coalesced to achieve that result. And so one of the mistakes we make in segmenting our work in knowledge, lending, and other things is that to achieve results, you need that knowledge, you need global technical, deep tacit in, in information, but you need to, and I think Magdi was mentioning, you need to build the capacity of change agents <coughs> to be able to implement things themselves, and it means forging coalitions. That's not necessarily about knowledge services, it's not necessarily about lending services, maybe more on the convening side, and if we are really going to achieve results, we need to bring that to bear. So I think I just wanted to bring to the, ta to the table that piece on change management, that if you're really going to achieve results, you have to bring that <laughs> skill into, into the equation. Um, this question was on ongoing peer review. I'm forgetting who mentioned it. Um, Magdi, I don't know if you mentioned it. Um, I think there's a very exciting model that we should be looking at. We've been trying this in, in, in the World Bank Institute part of my portfolio which is multi-country, multi-stakeholder action learning. Let me explain what, that, what I mean by that. You, let's say that you are working on difficult challenges. Let's say it's, um, I don't know, slum upgradation in 20 big metropolitan cities. I think what we should be doing is, and if we have projects or whichever type of engagement, we should be beginning a multi-country, multi-stakeholder engagement, bringing all the countries together, sometimes face-to-face, -face, sometimes um, virtually and having an ongoing process by which they compare results of what they're achieving, what, how they share tacit knowledge. This is a totally different way of approaching things, not just one client at a time, but multi-country, multi, just think of it, no one else can do this but us. If you bring public, private, civil society actors who are trying to work on some upgradation in 10 metropolitan cities across countries, and if you weave into it a process by which there is ongoing peer-to-peer -peer -peer review, but, uh, sharing of tacit knowledge, what you did, what I did, but it's an extraordinary opportunity to get people inspired with one another. <laughs> so I just wanted to put this in, you know, it's, it's a much deeper point, it's a much bigger point, but it's something no others can do it, and, but we can do it. But we have to, again, change our mindset in terms of my objective is to deliver one product to this one client and get promoted and move on. It's really a much more programmatic way of engagement. I think on Monica's points on OCC and, uh, and on the results, I think both have very good points. Uh, I think integrating, I, so I think that will be, but I wanted to make a deeper point here. If you think of it, if we start to not just say, okay, you'll have more training or we'll have a results group, how do we think cleverly about how do you devise incentives differently so mm -hmm. people have an incentive to do this, right? So let's think of it in the following way. We're just about to move into one of the most significant reforms, which is on global practices. Now, if the global practices are going to have accountability metrics on the quality of lending and knowledge services, but then that also involves that a way to do this is what is the quality of talent that you have? How did you grow that talent? Uh, what were the metrics for how did you how were you assessed and how were you assessing whether you achieved it? So all of a sudden, all those points on, on the incentives would be there. So the supply side would be there. Yeah, we can supply the services. But if I were a global practice director, I would be worrying about whether my, my pool is, and I think the gentleman there, the TTL, mm -hmm. sorry, I didn't, I didn't get your name. Um, I think that's a very good point. We are moving to a more problem-driven approach in the way that you were saying rather than a solutions provision. You know, what's happening right now in the, some of the dynamics of the matrix is that we're not necessarily trying to solve problems, we are trying to offer solutions based on who's available. So if you move to a problem-driven approach, which is what you were talking about, then you certainly need to understand how to 
deliver the solutions to that problem. Um, and if you do that, then if I were the global practice director, I would, I would have metrics to hold myself to account. I would have metrics for the talent. So I just wanted to say that while we work on the supply side of providing this, let's actually work on the demand side so that people would have an incentive to actually, because right now people are not really measured by whether their staff are, are rising to the, tal uh, to the so with that, let me just uh, stop there. <coughs> okay, we're coming towards the end of our time. I'm just gonna turn to the other two panelists, starting with Nenev, for any brief points. Um, thanks, I, I, I just wanted to, to second what Sanjay just said and, and the question on, on the solutions bank. I mean, um, e even as we organized ourselves selves in these deeper technical uh, business lines, we still have a difficulty to work across them because we go and offer to clients whatever the unit where we work offers. So we have to find beyond the training on, on solutions, we have to find incentives that are going to link us in terms of how we can offer uh, whatever that client needs. But I also wanted to push all of us to be a little bit more selective because as we design the practices, as we design the strategy of the World Bank uh, Group, we are obviously have to choose where we think we can have the biggest impact because we will not be able to, to solve all the problems for all the clients. So what is that capacity that we as, as organization have to, to build? To me, that's still the question. Okay, um, well, I think we're nearly done. Um, there were questions for IEG. I'm not sure if Caroline wants to say something. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to speak and give maybe some remarks. Um, there, there is, uh, when we talk about results, uh, that's about what changes are happening on the ground. And so the suggestion that Nena and Ani made about uh, learning from IEG, this is a question that we ask ourselves as well. What difference are we making? What, what is the result of our evaluations? We don't do them just to have submitted a report to the board, but it is to share the knowledge that comes from the, uh, them. And this event, I think, is an excellent illustration of how that can work and we are fully committed to dissemination we are shifting our communications and strategy group to being a, a lear knowledge learning and communications group so we are investing in the same directions as the the bank group is doing um, and then Nena you suggested we need to learn from IEG evaluations and embed these lessons into uh, work going forward now that is you're part of the deal. We can bring the lessons, we can share them, we can disseminate them, but ultimately the ownership has to then go uh, hand it over and, and, and get absorbed. Um, Sanjay, you uh, invited us to, to um, be part of the helping the structuring of the incentive system. And uh, having come to IEG, I'm, I'm very aware of how big a role IEG plays in influencing incentives. Uh, there have been many meetings where I've been at where people said, what you measure counts and that's what we're keeping an eye on. And so we are part of the dialogue. Um, we will be part of the dialogue in a way that maintains our independence because invariably at one point in time we will be asked to evaluate the change process and the results. But uh, it all lies in the dialogue. Um, and Monica, to your uh, provocative question in which you ended the panel, um, when are we going to evaluate against uh, changed objectives? This is a challenge I've put to my teams. I've said to them we need to develop a way not to sort of like uh, simply discard what the original promises were. The original promises that the bank group makes is a commitment and the uh, planned versus actual is a very important part of the accountability. But the part that I find very exciting and interesting to learn about is that when the bank group changes mid-course, what are the drivers of that change? Is it a reaction to something? And is it a timely reaction to something? Is it proactive, predicting and knowing that a country will require a change, of course? Or is it that circumstances force the bank group to change? And so these are things that are naturally a bit harder to evaluate, especially if there is no document trail of like why change was introduced. But this is a challenge uh, IEG is going to live up to. So thank you.
So please welcome me. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking the uh, the panel and the speakers, and particularly Juan Jose and Aristomen for leading the evaluation and and the learning from that. Thank you.